I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their day. We are super, super excited to have Laura Dunn here with Serve Justice. She's the Executive Director. Um, she's going to be giving our webinar today about the Campus Save Act and addressing gender violence on campus. Um, you, do, you can see a chat and questions. Feel, please feel free to ask questions and give comments. Uh, the way we're going to field them and deal with that is if there's something that's topic specific, we're going to bring it up to Laura while she's presenting. Otherwise, depending on the question or comment, we may hold it and wait towards um, the end of the webinar. But we love your feedback. We'd love to hear what you're thinking. Uh, you can also raise your hand if you have any tech issues or if you'd like to be unmuted so that you can say something over the line. So that being said, thanks so much for joining us, Laura. We'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this webinar, and thank you for WACASA for holding this webinar for everyone. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am a publicly known survivor of campus sexual assault. I will discuss my story. I was a student at the University of Wisconsin, so it's very meaningful for me to be giving this webinar right now in my former home state. Uh, I am also now the executive director of Serve Justice, which is a DC-based national nonprofit that provides legal assistance to survivors, specifically around the topic of campus sexual assault. We also regularly do training with institutions and support change makers in their community. So highly involved in addressing this issue of campus sexual violence. And in addition, I am soon to be an adjunct law professor at the University of Maryland on the topic of sexual violence and harassment in education. So this is my lifelong career addressing violence in education, and I look forward to sharing some information about the law and also um, some advocacy tips for you all. So let's go ahead and get started. Here's a quick overview, and you can hold me to this agenda. We're going to just briefly talk about what has happened in the last couple of years, there's been a very large movement, uh, largely driven by students, around the issue of gender violence on campus. And so I'm going to touch briefly on that history to kind of place us today with the rights that are available. Uh, I will touch on Title IX and the Clery Act. Um, and we'll go into the specifics of the Campus Save Act to discuss best practices around advocacy. And hopefully it'll be enough time at the end just to briefly touch on some things that are coming down the line. Legislation that is pending, some information coming out from the federal government to further advocacy efforts, and perhaps some remaining issues that need more grassroots level and institutional specific efforts. So a little bit about my own story. I find it very um, interesting that Wakasa has asked me to do this presentation because looking back at kind of the history of my experience and where I ended up today, I realized Wakasa is the first organization that gave me a platform for my voice. In December 2006, in their Connections newsletter, I actually wrote my survivor story. So I'm going to go ahead and take a moment to read that to you all to kind of give you a sense of what I went through and how I ended up here today. It was my junior year at the University of Wisconsin when I decided to go public with my rape. Although I had reported nearly a year before, the police still had not sought charges from the district attorney. I was, it was becoming obvious that the UW campus police and dean of students were sitting on my case until the last of the two assailants graduated. Shortly after my story made the front page, I threatened to file a police complaint, and my case was quickly sent up to the district's attorney's office. After about a month of waiting, the Dane County District Attorney met with me. As he started to explain why he was declining to press charges, I became confused. It had clearly been established that I was extremely intoxicated the night of my assault. I had come to with a bra wrapped around my neck and two men on top of me. If the perpetrators had freely admitted to that sexual contact, why wouldn't there be charges in my case? Apparently, the District Attorney found their actions to be, quote, morally reprehensible, unquote, but unfortunately below the legal standard for rape in the state of Wisconsin. I still cannot understand what more was needed. If I was unable to consent, if they admitted the sexual act, what was I missing? After meeting for two hours with the district attorney, it became clear that the problem was in the law. At that time, Wisconsin did not consider alcohol and intoxicant to nullify the elements of consent and rape. Basically, the prosecution would still need to prove that I had not consented 
due to my intoxication, I could not testify that I had not. My situation was not rare. Many cases of clear-cut sexual assault facilitated by alcohol were declined or lost in court, and they still are today. Each time the defense is a variation of, if she's too drunk to fight back, she's too drunk to know whether or not she consented. The victims are left in a no-win situation where intoxication has made them vulnerable to assault, and their memory or awareness of consent automatically suspects. Alcohol makes it easier for perpetrators both to rape and get away with it. A few weeks later, a news story appeared about my case and a newly passed law sponsored by the Wisconsin Coalition Against Sexual Assault. It made alcohol an intoxicant under the law. Though it was clear that my case had been lost, I was relieved to know that other victims of alcohol-facilitated sexual assault now had a fighting chance for justice. I deeply appreciated all those who supported the legislation, including Lakasa, as it was one of, one of many important steps towards creating a path of justice for survivors and paving the way for social change. So again, that was a quick excerpt from the December 2006 issue from Lakasa. And while that story focuses largely on what happened from the criminal aspect of my case, my story also has civil and campus aspects. Um, civilly, just briefly, I did seek an attorney for assistance, was not told about the statute of the limitations, and ultimately could not find another lawyer to take on a malpractice lawsuit because it involved the University of Wisconsin and everyone seemed to be conflicted out to my city. But the campus process is what I'm most known for, and I want to talk about my story moving forward into our next topic, which is the movement against campus sexual assault. While I was very outspoken in the state of Wisconsin and on my campus, I quickly found myself in the center of a national movement. And to date, it's been about half a decade, five years, of many student activists leading this movement, asking for change, and really trying to curb the epidemic of sexual violence. So I'm going to pick up the movement in 2010. There are definitely actions that happened before then. My story came out in 2006. There's many other survivors and activists who have made efforts before that. In 2010, something very specific happened. The Center for Public Integrity did a very deep investigative series into campus sexual violence and specifically Title IX as a method to address uh, campus's failures to deal with sexual assault. While there are many survivor stories that were featured in that case, I was the only one who chose to use my full name to share my face and to speak out publicly. And because of that series, that was picked up ultimately by NPR and won lots of media awards, there was increased pressure on the Department of Education when several advocates started demanding new guidance. Um, and I had the privilege of being invited to meetings with the Department of Education's Office on Civil Rights to meet then Assistant Secretary Russell and Ali to discuss what should be in this new guidance. Where was Title IX failing? What were victims of campus sexual assault facing that had not been addressed? And as hopefully you all know at this point, in 2011, the Dear Colleague letter was released. That is a guidance about Title IX. It was the first time sexual violence was specifically addressed. Prior to that, most guidances did deal with sex discrimination and sexual harassment. But that 2011 guidance really dug deeply into the issue of sexual violence, especially distinguishing the campus's ongoing obligations from deferring to campus police. What many don't know about that same time, I would say the same week that that guidance came out, which was April 4th, exactly seven years to the day of my assault, um, was that several advocates and myself started working on the campus safe blueprint. We knew that this guidance, this Dear Colleague letter, was an amazing sea change. But what so few know is that a guidance is temporary. It can change with administration. It can change depending on leadership. It actually does not have the force of law, nor is it given any deference in court. So while it's an amazing tool, it was not federal statute. And so we started working on this blueprint. And in 2012, we introduced the Campus Save Act uh, into Congress. The Campus Save Act stands for Sexual Violence Elimination Act. Our goal, again, was to take a lot of what happened in the guidance and put it into law and also to find some holes that still existed that survivors needed rights around. And in 2012, that was introduced into Congress. It made it into the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization. And those of you who were involved 
I'm sure will remember, 2012 was actually a very historical year for the Violence Against Women Act. Every single year since 1994, when that act first passed into law, it has been passed unanimously without any kind of issue. And in 2012, for the first time ever, Congress did not pass this reauthorization. I remember that moment being very um, difficult for a lot of advocates and myself. I was working with many national organizations who have been doing this for decades, and they had never seen anything like it happen before. And I turned from doing advocacy just on the Campus Save Act to doing advocacy on behalf of the entire Violence Against Women Act reauthorization, speaking specifically to the campus provision. Thankfully, in 2013, it was in reintroduced and ultimately passed into law in late February, and President Obama signed it into law in March 2013. 2013 also had another big moment. Uh, I think it's a moment a lot of people have passed over, but its significance cannot be minimized. It's actually vaguely referenced in the hunting ground itself. But in July 2013, over 100 student activists flew into Washington, D.C. and protested outside the U.S. Department of Education. In fact, you can see a picture of the students there. And there are many well-known activists. You can see Amy Clark, Andrea Pino, John Kelly. So many more were present and demanding their rights. And we didn't just come with our bodies. We actually came with over 112,000 signatures saying that the Department of Education needed to improve enforcement. And we looked at Title IX, we looked at the Clery Act, and we looked at just other areas that really needed assistance. And because of this protest, that day, we actually met with the U.S. Department of Education Secretary uh, Arnold Duncan and a variety of other individuals. We also went later that day to the White House and started having conversations to what ultimately led into the next major point in history, the 2014 White House Task Force to Protect Students Against Sexual Violence. A lot of our policy points and our demands are actually integrated into the Not Alone Report. Also, the 2014 Title IX guidance, um, frequently asked questions of Title IX and sexual violence came out, and again, really met a lot of our needs. We wanted to make sure LGBTQ and same-sex violence were recognized. We wanted to make sure students with, that are international or undocumented also had recognition and additional support, and you'll see those provisions in the guidance. That really was due to the efforts of a lot of advocates, but I really give credit to New Year 9 who was one of the primary forces in organizing edact now. In the fall of 2014, It's On Us campaign launched. Um, if you don't have that campaign on your campus, definitely something to look at. It was a, a great opportunity for President Obama and Vice President Biden to kind of reiterate the ongoing commitment to ending sexual violence. And by the end of 2014, we saw a lot of roundtables hosted by Senator McCaskill uh, one on the Clery Act, which I had the honor of speaking at, one on Title IX, and one on the criminal justice system where No Year 9 was present, kind of representing survivors and student activists. And out of that came what happened in 2015. Introductions of the Campus Accountability and Safety Act, um, SOS and HALT, other pieces of legislation. And I will circle back at the end, touch more on these pieces of legislation and let you know and of what's happening on the Hill, where this legislation may be going. But that's what's happened in the last half decade because of student activist support. There's obviously been many other protests on campuses, many other efforts, a lot of advocacy organizations supporting and getting involved to make change on their campus. So moving on to the focus of our topic, now that you have a little bit of this history, let's talk about where victims' rights are today, what information is out there that you can be using as part of your advocacy. Title IX is the first guidance, and I apologize I moved through that a little too quickly, some technical difficulty there. Um, Title IX was introduced back in 1972, and I always like to actually give a clip of what that statute looks like. Um, this is the main part of Title IX. This is what everyone is referring to when they talk about Title IX. No person in the U.S. shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation, denied benefits, or subjected to discrimination in the educational setting. No person. It's a very broad statute. And a lot of the information we now have about Title IX doesn't come from the statute. Again, it comes from guidance. 
So I went ahead and listed four guidances that you as advocates absolutely should have handy. I encourage you to read through it on a semi-regular basis. The Dear Colleague Letter of 2011, the retaliation guidance that came out in 2013, that frequently asked questions I referred to coming out of the White House Task Force at the same time in 2014. And in 2015, there was a broader guidance kind of more towards those who work in Title IX positions on campus and information around your duties, which is also very helpful for advocates to have and to know about. Beyond these guidances that all are specifically discussing sexual assault, um, there is a 2001 and a 2008 guidance that talk a lot about sexual harassment. Because discrimination under Title IX that basis of sex includes sexual harassment as well as sexual violence and even gender-based harassment and discrimination. You always want to make sure we're remembering the full scope of Title IX, which in a minute I will contrast with that of the Clery Act. So just a brief reminder that sexual harassment has to be severe and pervasive. There is a standard of what has to be met. Um, sexual violence is different. It inherently is sufficiently severe and pervasive um, because it's a physical act uh, perpetrated against another. So focusing more on the rights aspect, the information that every advocate should know that victims have when coming forward. Um, the first of rights attached around reporting that initial uh, actual notice given to schools. So the standard under Title IX is actual notice if you're thinking about lawsuits. And is a little more generous. And so if you're filing a Title IX complaint, they're looking for actual notice or should have reasonably known. Um, a lot of times, survivors will come forward and choose confidentiality. It is actual notice, and uh, depending on where they go, it may be reasonable notice if it's not going right to the top. The confidentiality options are very important for survivors, as I'm sure so many of you already know. And during this opportunity to confidentially advise with someone, information really needs to be given about the campus process as well as the criminal process and the right to access both. There is an unfortunate tendency in advocacy to encourage or discourage one route over another. And there is good reason for that. As my survivor story shared, I had a great disappointment around the criminal process. Um, but through my work with Serve Justice, our goal is really to make any avenue of justice accessible for survivors, to make sure they feel supported in whatever route that they choose, and they know that every route is, in fact, an option for them. Um, some information that's important during this kind of this confidential period is actually information on legal assistance. I think campuses are really good at giving all the rights around counseling and support. A lot of victim advocacy centers have developed strong relationships and get referrals. There's unfortunately a lack of information on legal assistance, and that's a very important right. Survivors are supposed to get that information, and that can be legal assistance to getting protective orders. Um, and to you know, consider civil options or any other avenue that may be implicated. Sometimes there's a ripple effect because of sexual violence and other legal issues arise. So making sure that there's information on that is a vital right under Title IX. And of course, victims uh, aren't the only reporting source. Sometimes third parties report what has happened, whether that be peers, other individuals on campus who are aware. And in those cases, consent is actually required. I, I view that as a right. Victims have the right to consent and choose a formal process. And because they can consent, they can also not consent. The formal process obviously accesses Title IX grievance procedures, which we will discuss next in the related rights. But it also can, if they choose not to consent to that route, lead to some kind of informal process. And I want to kind of emphasize rights around the informal process that the survivor doesn't want to move forward, which is absolutely their right. And as those of us who are committed to victim-centered advocacy know deeply important the healing and the renewing of autonomy. But if a survivor is looking at an informal process, there are still rights and obligations under Title IX. Um, retaliation protections have to be brought up because a lot of times survivors are not choosing that avenue because of fear. The school really does have the obligation, and victims really do have the right to be protected against retaliation in a meaningful way. And so retaliation protections are supposed to be discussed with survivors considering the informal process. 
And there is an obligation for schools, even without consent, after talking and encouraging survivors saying you will be protected, if there's still not consent, there is a consideration of broader campus safety. Is this a repeat perpetrator? What's the risk of, uh, to others in the community? Uh, is, is the age of the victim is young. There's also a compelling interest there supported by state law mandatory requirements. Um, and so schools have to undertake that assessment at the end, no matter what, whether the survivor still doesn't want to move forward, even if there is or is not an obligation for campus safety, there has to be some type of remedial action. It can be as simple as a training, which doesn't have to involve uh, the survivor and it doesn't have to involve the school moving forward without them, but it can also be a school moving forward without a survivor in a complaint. So after that initial report, there are rights around interim measures. Um, survivors are able to be free from ongoing hostile environment created by this violence. While sexual harassment allows mediation, that is not an appropriate interim measure for sexual violence. I would like to think that that died back in 2011 when the Title IX guidance made it very clear that wasn't allowed. But it still comes up, and it should be something as advocates we are, are not supporting. It doesn't mean that there can't be um, survivor input as to any sanction that's agreed to at the end of the hearing, um, but it really does mean that the survivor and the accused should not be put face to face and forced uh, to work it out amongst themselves. Transformative justice models may have a different variation, um, but right now the federal government has not acknowledged that and schools have not actually shown an ability uh, to address sexual violence through that avenue. So things that are rights that can attach right away when there is this interim measure that's space between reporting and any type of hearing and outcome is an obligation to eliminate the hostile environment. A lot of us have advocated for survivors to get no contact orders. Um, there is also an option of interim suspension, and we'll get into that later when we talk about best practices. How do we get a student suspended in the interim? It is possible. It's something I regularly advocate for, and it's something to add to your toolbox. So we'll circle back there later on. To prevent its reoccurrence, obviously restructuring campus schedules, making sure that no contact order is very specific about what areas individuals can enter, what's the space limitation, what kind of interactions are limited, and of course to address its effects. Immediately having interim steps and accommodations for survivors, and also again remembering that the obligation extends beyond survivors to campus communities. So let's say the survivor has opted for a formal process. That's where the kind of amazing aspects of victims' rights exist for Title IX. Unlike the criminal justice system, which makes victims merely witnesses and really detaches them from the process, Title IX really brings survivors in as an equal party who can advocate for themselves, can have rights to present, and to have an outcome that ideally is uh, both prompt and equitable. Part of these rights are to a prompt investigation, that 60-day window. Um, there has to be justification for any delays. A lot of times we will see accused obviously have right to promptness, but will opt to delay that uh, in an effort often to avoid a negative outcome. Because victims have a comparable right, that can actually be used to keep it within the 60 days. And I'll talk more about how the Clery Act actually furthers that um, ability to advocate for prompt hearings in a moment. Additional rights are to have the same access, or sorry, same option to lawyers, witnesses, information, and participation in hearings, and to make sure that information is provided about the standard of evidence, about the outcome, about any appeal rights. And something I always like to point out because I think it's often law, the sanctions that are given, there is actually a right for survivors to make sure that these sanctions do in fact remedy the hostile environment. So if it's a ticky tacky, summer suspension, uh, probation, or what is a serious act of violence, there actually are victims' rights that counteract that and can be argued against that, first through appeal and then ultimately through a Title IX complaint. And of course, uh, a last but very deeply important right that I think has not gotten enough attention in recent months, um, the right against retaliation. Retaliation is considered by case law a form of sex discrimination. It is a violation of Title IX just like anything else, and that includes intimidation, threats, coercion. A lot of times survivors will come and report retaliation as far as like social ostracism. 
we have individuals who are part of Greek life. They've reported a fraternity or a fraternity member, and all of a sudden they are being ostracized. Unfortunately, that standard does not hold. It really is something higher, the intimidation, the threats, the coercion. Um, and so survivors really have to be keeping information on that and, of course, getting actual notice to school. Uh, one of the tragedies to be able to enforce a right, of course, you need to give the school actual notice. They have to have the obligation attached to them. So survivors who are discouraged through systems who have not seen the responsiveness they desire often give up on informing schools about retaliation and they lose the opportunity to be protected and they also lose the opportunity to file complaints. So this is a very important right. And uh, information that is always deeply helpful, a lot of it is talked about in the 2001 Title IX guidance on sexual harassment. Um, this obligation to prevent retaliation obviously extends to perpetrators or those who have been accused if they're not found responsible, but also to their associates. And oftentimes schools will give a no contact order to the accused and it'll say third parties can't contact on your behalf. But then other members, other friends will go ahead and do this on their own, and schools will not have given them notice against retaliation. So being really thoughtful as advocates to make sure that this protection against associate retaliation is uh, pre-thought out. If there's already signs, let's just give an example, because I've seen it before, of fraternities whose uh, membership will turn against the survivor, putting that entire um, student organization on notice with a no contact order might be appropriate and is in fact a right under Title IX. And of course, schools cannot retaliate. Hey, so moving on look, to... Looks like yeah. we have a question. Um, Hi, Laura. Okay. There's a question um, about the actual notice um, required for Title IX and the confidentiality provisions. Can you just talk a little more about how those relate? I know you mentioned that um, a survivor may have to choose confidentiality. Uh, but how does that relate to the actual notice? If you could just touch on that. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. So again, just to recap a little bit before going into the answer, under Title IX as far as lawsuits, you need actual notice. So someone with the authority to address the issue under Title IX does have to, in fact, be directly informed. Um, the Department of Education has a lower standard if you're thinking about Title IX complaints both of actual notice, of, but uh, should have known. And so what often happens in looking at confidentiality, there's different levels of confidentiality on campus. There's complete confidentiality, which is often offered by those with privilege. We're thinking about pastoral kind of privileges, um, counselors who are licensed. Those individuals, um, if they're informed by a survivor, that often does not constitute um, actual notice because of the confidentiality requirements. Um, but there are kind of gradients of confidentiality. Under the Clery Act, for example, there are some people like health professionals and counselors who, while they will not report the specific incident, still have to report um, the crime statistics. Something similar exists under Title IX. So Title IX coordinators may not get the specifics of, you know, who the victim is, what they're complaining of, but will have notice. You know, we had another report of um, a sexual assault from a football team member, and we have concerns around that. And that information does have to go to school, and that may constitute reasonable notice. So there is a delicate balance, and what's hard about answering the question much more specifically beyond that is schools decide who is confidential and who is not. Under Title IX, you might be designated as a responsible employee, and it's, it's not possible for you to keep the level of confidentiality a survivor may want. And you will have to report up. My recommendation, though, to balance confidentiality and any obligation you may have as a responsible employee is to report directly to the Title IX coordinator who is supposed to be identifying patterns of discrimination. That way, confidentiality can be kept within limits, um, but what we see very often that kind of violates all survivor expectations are, and I'll, I'll demonstrate it by an example, let's say a resident assistant finds out. And so they have an obligation, even if the survivor wants confidentiality, and rather than going just to a Title IX coordinator, they go to the head of residence life, 
who then gets the police, who then tells the Title IX coordinator there, who then tells the dean of students. And all of a sudden we have several people. And confidentiality is pretty much lost at that point. So I hope that gives a better sense um, with confidentiality. If you are a designated responsible employee, which is something you have to ask your school about, um, you can maintain confidentiality and meet the obligations by going directly to the Title IX coordinator with their complaint rather than that chain of command. But again, your school may have very specific, specific requirements, and those of you who may work for the school should, of course, follow that. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, we can definitely, I will take more questions on that at the end if that's helpful. So moving on to the Clery Act. And so I just want to pause for a moment. The Campus Save Act is the Clery Act. The Campus Save Act is the name of a bill that was passed through the Violence Against Women Act and amended the Clery Act. So the Save, VAWA, and Clery Act are one and the same. And I think that might be helpful. So as I move to the Clery Act, I am talking about VAWA and I am talking about the Campus Save Act, which is kind of the main focus of today's um, presentation. So I'll breeze through this. Um, hopefully many of you know this. If you do not know this, I'm going to go ahead and recommend right now that you download um, offline the Violence Against Women Act amendments to the Clery Act. Again, that's the same as Campus Save. Download the regulations that just came into effect July 1st, 2015, because everything I'm about to present is laid out in those regulations in more detail than in the statute. So under the Clery Act, Sexual violence is still covered under the term sexual assault. Rape is covered, which I think most people know, but oftentimes people forget that fondling is also, in fact, included. Incest and statutory rape are also included, but of course less common. You can kind of breeze through the definitions of rape and fondling below. Uh, the good news is that because of the Campus Save Act, uh, updating the Clery Act, we now have a definition that is not gender specific. So again, ability to advocate for any student affected by sexual violence regardless um, of their gender or sexual orientation or the context in which the violation occurred. But it's broader than sexual assault, it's broader than sexual violence. We're talking about other forms of gender violence, including dating. Um, dating violence is a, a combination of what a survivor is reporting. Uh, if they report an intimate or romantic nature to the relationship with an individual, and yes, that can mean hooking up. Um, that question comes up a lot, unfortunately, from police. And so as advocates, if you're ever working with police, uh, explaining that the definition of dating violence does allow less formal relationships, not the traditional dating boyfriend, girlfriend, to still fall under this umbrella is important. Um, and that determination of whether it is, in fact, dating violence is a combination of the survivor's report, um, emphasizing the nature of their relationship, but it also is an assessment that law enforcement or school officials should be making using the statements, the length of relationship, the type of relationship. But again, I can assure you, hooking up is, in fact, included. The handbook that will be coming out that further defines it will kind of go into that discussion which happens at the rulemaking committee. Dating violence is, of course, distinct from domestic violence. Um, I think most of us are familiar with that. There's obviously a deeper relationship, whether it's marriage, a child, cohabitation, and it really is actually governed by state law. It's kind of the only definition that gives significant deference to state law rather than providing the definition in its own. And of course, last but definitely not least, and often forgotten by school officials, by officers, and unfortunately even by advocates, is the crime of stalking, which comes up a lot even with other types of gender violence. And it's a very open definition, so it takes special note and make sure that we're always assessing for the presence of stalking. It's a course of conduct that would cause a reasonable person to fear for their safety, the safety of others, or suffer emotional distress. And this reasonable person standard is a very liberal definition. It's a person under the same circumstances, so if it's a young college female, same circumstances and same identity. Laura, is there time for a question? Yes. Um, 
We have, do you have any specific guidance available about the definition used in regards to impartial and or how that relates to possible conflicts of interest? Yes, we are going to get there um, a little later. So if you can slay that question again when we're talking about um, hearings, that's where that comes up most often. Um, I will definitely make sure to touch on that. And then one so, more. Mm -hmm. uh, please expand on the balance between survivors' right not to have institution investigate with campus safety needs. I have seen investigations move forward when the survivor has opted to no longer participate based on pattern of behavior, et cetera. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, like I mentioned, I will circle back and talk about conflicts of interest. And if you can remind me of the question at that point, um, very briefly, balancing survivor interest between campus safety needs, it, it is just that, a balance. There is no right or wrong. It really is um, specific to the circumstances. Um, and what would be really helpful, uh, if you want more information, is download the 2001 and the 2011 guidances on Title IX. The 2001 actually breaks it down very specifically. Um, schools should ask for survivor consent. If it's denied, they should give very clear and direct information about protections the school offers regarding safety and prevention of retaliation in an effort to encourage the survivor to give consent. If the survivor still does not, the school has to independently determine whether there is a, a compelling campus safety need. Um, is it a repeat perpetration? Is it a context in which it's likely to occur again? Has there already been a pattern of discrimination and violence with that group or organization where this report is coming from? And at that point, if the school says, yes, there's a compelling campus safety need, they can do a variety of things. Um, if they have enough information to move to a hearing without the victim, they could do that. They are, in fact, allowed to do so. The victim would not have to participate in that hearing, so the school could, in fact, use the information from that survivor's report for that. Um, the school could also choose not to have a formal hearing. Maybe they don't feel like it's strong enough without the victim's participation and consent. And so maybe they have alternative remedies. Maybe that individual or that student organization where this uh, report is coming from gets targeted training and monitoring. We often have schools who will bust, for example, fraternities on underage alcohol serving because they cannot get them on sexual violence. Um, there are kind of different methods to alleviate the same problem. So that's the short answer. And again, I am happy to circle back at the end and talk on it more. So let's move forward into the victim's rights aspect of the Clery Act. Um, so the rights are actually really helpful, I would say, under the Clery Act. And those of you who kind of maybe have some frustrations with Title IX being guidance and allowing some weighing and decision making, you might actually really like to compare it with the Clery Act. For example, there is an option to report to the police, but the actual statute of the Clery Act gives an option not to report. It is, in fact, a right for victims not to report and to use the police, which is very important in some jurisdictions where there are efforts uh, to compel that kind of reporting. We'll hopefully have time to circle back and talk on that later. Survivors also get information on all possible sanctions and every protective measure that is available to them. Confidentiality can be kept despite any timely warning given. And again, on, on and off campus resources, um, you can see that it's emergency care as well as, of course, that legal assistance, again, is required. So just like Title IX, survivors also have rights in the interim. Uh, Clery Act calls them accommodations. These accommodations attach regardless of whether a victim wants to formally move forward. So merely identifying as a, a victim of sexual violence gives you these rights. You do not have to access the formal process. They immediately attach and should be provided. The four areas that uh, the Clery Act emphasize, although there can, of course, be more based on survivor needs, is academic living, work, and transportation. Um, making sure that schools have uh, kind of academic support is very important. Please don't ever leave a survivor to talk to several people to get accommodations. Always try to advocate for there to be one person, their academic advisor, the Title IX coordinator, if the school has a designated advocate, 
make sure they have the authority to be the sole point of contact to help the survivor easily get these accommodations. Uh, living situations are often related to safety, making sure that they are moved, let out of housing contracts, absolutely ask for money back if there is a delay or some change in cost that is not supposed to be part of these accommodations. So that's a good opportunity for advocacy. And of course, if they work on campus or using campus transportation, remembering that they have rights to be assisted in those areas as needed. So here's what I'll, I'll touch a little bit on um, the conflicts of interest that was raised. So going into campus hearings, um, I didn't have it on the Title IX slide, but I will say both Title IX and the Clery Act do absolutely mention both real and perceived conflicts of interest. Schools are supposed to be revealing who is, in fact, on the adjudication panel. Who are those individuals? As an advocate, get those names before that hearing ever starts. You should know when you get the date of the hearing, who is on that panel, and whether they have a real or even a perceived conflict of interest that can be addressed by the school. That's really the opportunity to have um, that conversation. I've seen many schools wait, and all of a sudden, two students will walk into a hearing, and one of them will say, oh, I had that person as a professor. And unfortunately, the hearing is canceled. It has to be rescheduled. It's the worst case scenario if you're looking for a prompt hearing on an issue. Other rights under um, the Clery Act, which I think are very invaluable, just like Title IX requires promptness, so does the Clery Act. But if there is a delay, the Clery Act goes further. The Campus Save Act has um, developed regulations that say any delay has to be, quote, for a good cause. And it has to be in writing. Without that, you actually have a violation of victims' rights. And that's something you say, hey, unless there's a good cause delay in writing that you are giving to us for our records, you cannot, in fact, delay. Um, again, equal rights within the hearing. What is nice about the Clear Act is it goes further to give concrete examples. Title IX is more of a guidance. It adjusts the different situations. The Clear Act puts some staple pieces in there. There must be an advisor of choice for survivors. Here is an opportunity for advocacy. Advisor of choice means any choice, on-campus workers, off-campus workers. We're talking, you could bring a best friend, you could bring a parent, you could bring a therapist, you could bring a lawyer. And in fact, a lot of survivors who are up against accused with lawyers may want that option because, of course, we are seeing defense attorneys not just help in these hearings, but perhaps later filing lawsuits against survivors or the school in which the survivor still gets roped in as a witness. So great opportunity to have lawyers at the table if there's that kind of level of need. And again, access to the same amount of witnesses and information and focusing more on the written notification. Very similar to Title IX, but again, going just one step farther. Not only is there an outcome in writing, but there is a reason for the finding. So if you're getting letters that say insufficient evidence, period, that is not meeting the standard of the Clery Act. They are violating a federal regulation that demands there be a reason. And the justification for that reasoning is because the survivor also has a right to appeal. If they don't know why an outcome was some way, how could they ever appeal it? So it's a logical extension of the statute within that regulation, a reason for the finding, and even a reason for the sanction. Why was a semester suspension appropriate? How does that actually remedy the hospital environment because again, your advocacy can extend to what sanction is given. Is it remedying it? Is there justification in your written decision? And you're getting both federal laws come into play there. I'll also say that there's a right to be uh, informed of any changes to results. So we're not just talking about the outcome, the appeal outcome, or the finalizing of results. Any change. So if we have a defense attorney who behind the scenes is working to get a plea bargain for the student. He got a notice of suspension. The defense attorney says, well, he'll actually withdraw and waive you know, any right to a lawsuit if you just allow him to graduate still. We've definitely seen those cases. Virginia Wesleyan had an example of that. We've also seen students who um, have 
graduated, uh, or sorry, have not been allowed to graduate but still get a physical diploma so effectively can act as if they have graduated. So any change to results, the survivors are supposed to get notice, and because they're given notice and they have equitable rights, they should also have an opportunity to intervene and prevent those backdoor deals that some defense attorneys are doing with schools. And the very last right before we transition into more breast practices where I definitely, again, encourage lots of questions as they come up um, is protection against retaliation. It exists under Title IX. It also exists under the Clery Act. And something I should mention, another big bonus of the Clery Act, why the Campus Save Act matters, $35,000 maximum fine attaches per violation. So there's a little more kick to a lot of these rights. Title IX, the sanction is removal of federal funds, which has quite frankly never been done. A lot of times schools will make a voluntary agreement to resolve issues, but there's actually a cost to violating the rights under the Clery Act. So I'll just pause here for a moment, um, just gauging time. I'm going to do my best to get all the way to the end. Uh, I may kind of skimp on the last section about what's on the horizon. I'll touch on it briefly. I really want to get into the meat of some best practices. I've shared them as I've gone through, but I want to kind of highlight a few of them. So opportunities for advocacy around that initial reporting. If you are lucky enough to get a survivor very early in the process and they're deciding to make a report and they do know already they want the formal process, getting in there, being part of that, because under the Clery Act, they're allowed an advisor of choice and that's not just in hearings, that's in any meeting related to disciplinary hearings, you can actually go in with that survivor, and I would advocate that there be a single, thorough, written interview once, so that survivors don't have to keep telling different people, and make it fairly clear that that survivor is willing to do follow-up questions on one occasion. You do not want your survivor stuck in a situation where we've had with some of our clients where there's a very prolonged, every week, more questions, more questions, more questions. But at some point, a survivor can get broken down, um, always feeling like they have to defend and explain repeatedly. So really getting in there early, if that's what's wanted by the survivor. Again, there's also, of course, confidentiality. And you have a survivor who is thinking about reporting, directing them to the appropriate confidential resource. Um, again, counselors, uh, people of privilege, pastoral staff, they're protected. There are other designated confidential personnel, which is campus-specific, and looking that up is important. But make sure that if confidentiality cannot be maintained, if the survivor comes to you and says, well, I already told the RA, I'm worried that there's a big change, anything that you can do early to get that complaint, again, not to go through a chain of several people, but to go straight to the Title IX coordinator, to the source, Title IX coordinators can maintain confidentiality and meet the obligation of mandatory reporting, which is simply to detect patterns of discrimination on campus. Campuses are supposed to figure out, are there hot spots for sexual violence or sexual harassment? Because they do have an obligation to every student to do more training, to do more efforts, maybe even to be more thoughtful of who they're hiring or how they're supervision. So you want that to happen, but I think minimizing that chain of command if you have that opportunity is very important. Maybe it's also something you can work on as far as policy and procedure with a school to ensure. And again, making sure when a school is moving forward, regardless of desires for confidentiality, Title IX guidance in 2001, and I believe again in 2011, makes very clear, even if the school is moving forward without consent, confidentiality must be maintained to the highest degree possible. And just to kind of unpack what that means, for due process purposes, the survivor's name may still be given to the accused if there's a formal hearing. That's just required if there is going to be um, a hearing to remove the student for what happened to that survivor. But that does not mean they get to go around asking a ton of other people spreading that survivor's name. They still have an obligation uh, to keep the confidentiality even if they're moving forward. What that looks like, again, is unfortunately very specific to the fact. Um, again, 
I mentioned earlier, no force police reporting. There's a $35,000 fine if you violate the Clery Act. State law, of course, can require that. And if we have time, we'll touch on that. But right now, I, I don't know of a lot of states that require it. So the Clery Act is protecting survivors from being forced to engage in police. And again, I, we've had the question, what if a survivor doesn't want to move forward? There is actually also situations we get here at Serve Justice that are complete opposites. We have one survivor who wants to move forward and several others from the same perpetrator who do not. And we actually do want to advocate for the school to use their authority to remove this individual because if they look at it in isolation, the accused may still stay on campus. But if they saw the broader picture, he'd be gone. And so what Title IX guidance says, if you are advocating from that position, is that actual notice, even if it's given by a third party, is enough to trigger actual notice, to trigger that obligation under Title IX, as long as it's quote unquote credible. That is the guidance language, not mine. So if there's a credible report, a school does have to undertake that assessment, acknowledge the repeat perpetration, and determine if those other cases can be included in that hearing. So if there's only one victim, but who's moving forward with the formal process, but eight others are known, their names, their stories can, in fact, go into the hearing as part of the institution's obligation. Without consent, though, they do have to weigh, and the school does have to make its own choice, but you can be advocating for that assessment. Regarding safety measures, I talked about making sure you think beyond the no-contact order. There is such a thing as interim suspension. How would you advocate for that? You've got to know the school's policy. Um, it may be under interim suspension. It may be under no trespass orders. Um, in some schools, state schools often have statutory guidance about when you can, in fact, remove an individual from campus, even temporarily. So knowing what source of information you need, what standards exist for that campus, for that state, and oftentimes, they revolve around two circumstances. When there is already physical evidence of violence, from, in my mind, with my advocacy, if there's a rape kit, that's enough for me to push for this. Or ongoing threats to safety, if there is even so much as one text threat or something caught in writing or witnessed as a threat, grab it and use that as a justification for an interim suspension. There are court cases that have upheld schools suspending students just for the threat of violence against another. So there is a lot of institutional authority. Schools don't often default to thinking about it, but as advocates, if that's what's desired, if that's what's best, you can, in fact, push schools to go there. If you are getting a no contact order, make sure that it's one way. Do not have survivors sign the same contact order and agree the same to an accused. It's just like a restraining order. It is meant to protect the victims against those who have been accused. Same with a no contact order. Victims are not in trouble. Their rights are not limited. It is the accused whose rights are limited temporarily during the interim. And there can also be negotiation. A lot of people will just take whatever no contact order is given to them. Do not do that. If there is a problem, if there is a gap, advocate immediately for it to be fixed. Some survivors want 25-foot radius. Some survivors want one dining hall for themselves, or they want certain hours in the library to avoid the accused. Those are things that can and should be negotiated by advocates. And the biggest thing that I can encourage you to do is make sure retaliation protection is listed in the order so specifically that everyone knows what happens if there is a violation. It shouldn't be vague. It shouldn't be left out, because what a lot of schools do will just talk to the accused student and remind them that they are not supposed to do that. That is not sufficient. We want to know that there'll be an additional misconduct charge. We want to know there'll be an immediate investigation. We want to know if that investigation turns up evidence sufficient to support this report, that that will be added to the hearing. They could be facing more than one charge coming into that hearing. But if you don't negotiate that up front, I'm going to tell you a lot of schools won't do it on the back end. Victim accommodations, again, just some tips. I focused more on academics, but always holistically talking to your survivor about all their needs. Do they work on campus? Are they using transportation that puts them in contact with the accused? What are their living arrangements? 
Um, but academically, here are some options. You can change schedules, but you can also think of alternatives. We've had some survivors who have gotten independent study or don't have to come in and can watch recordings. Think outside the box and be creative because the standard under both Title IX and the Clery Act is reasonableness. It's not if the school feels like it. It's not does the school do this all the time. It's not is there a policy already. The federal law standard is is it reasonable. And if it's reasonable, guess what? They have to do it. So really framing all your um, advocacy around this is a reasonable accommodation. This can happen. It's very feasible. Something's unreasonable, for example, if you'd have to hire a whole new professor or have a whole new course created for one survivor. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about unreasonable. And make sure also, a quick reminder, a lot of survivors not only qualify for accommodations under Title IX and the Clery Act, they also have it for disability. The ADA, Section 504, if a survivor has a diagnosis, make sure you're connecting them with services. It touched a lot on how to help during investigations with advocacy. Again, having one report and only one follow-up, I would kind of be on guard. If you're getting a lot of questions that are about a defense, a defense that doesn't prove whether or not sexual violence occurs, but maybe attacks their character or goes about it a different way, those are opportunities to really remind the school an investigation is to make sure there's evidence of a violation. A hearing is the opportunity to go into defenses. So really kind of being on guard and encouraging the investigation to be prompt and for any defenses to be addressed during a hearing where there's appropriate equitable procedures. Getting a timeline up front for the process uh, for survivors is actually an obligation of the Clery Act. Thank you, Campus Save. Schools should have deadlines. They should have a general sense of when the investigative report will be due, when will the hearing be scheduled. And in addition to that, Title IX says there should be status updates. Maybe that's something you want to advocate for up front, a weekly email every Friday. What has happened? What's going to happen? Where they are on their timeline? Are they on point? Do they anticipate any delays? And again, during the hearing, advocating for equitable rights and um, really intervening uh, if there is any kind of creation of a hostile environment. And that's what the next slide kind of goes into. Um, there's a lot of opportunities within hearing to make sure that there's equity, uh, whether that's asking the panel to review questions an accused may ask and have to approve them to make sure that they're not offensive um, or otherwise violating privacy. I would even encourage you, if the school still does direct cross-examination of an accused to a victim, declining and saying, Title IX discourages that and we are ready to file a complaint if you want to move that. And then again, offering this alternative, but if the accused want to get questions to the panel, we can work with you. That's a good way to avoid the issue up front. I would also encourage you to create objections and rules of evidence before you go into a hearing if you're an advisor and serving in that role. Their school may not allow objections, but there's always Title IX that says you can't allow a hostile environment even in a hearing. So if they're asking up previous sexual history, guess what? You can object under the 2014 guidance. There's specific language saying you cannot go there. So really preparing, quote unquote, objections. What would you anticipate and block using federal law and guidance? And same with rules. Really talking to the school beforehand and saying we want to make sure witnesses are either presenting evidence or have direct testimony. We don't want second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand blind accusations from witnesses, which often happen. And a very last note on sanctions, really make sure that you are asking in the hearing for what sanction you want. If the survivor wants expulsion, driving for that. If they're open to suspension, mentioning that as well. But don't ever allow a school to say that counseling, reflection papers, training is a sanction. It's not. It could be a condition, but that's not a negative consequence. These are not negative things. Those are not sanctions. So make sure there's an advocacy for sanctions and that everything else is clearly denoted as a condition. So I did anticipate going over just a little bit. There's one minute over. I'm going to let you just kind of look through on the horizon. We have some bills in Congress, CASA, HALT, SOS. They center a lot around enforcement of Title IX and the Clery Act, providing advocates or counselors on campus 
I'm very happy to answer questions about those if you have them later. Federal resources coming out. There is going to be campus adjudicator training created by the federal government. It's already piloted. It will come out very soon. And that handbook on the Campus Save Act, on VAWA, on the Clery Act, is coming out as well. There's a meeting in a few weeks for that. And last but not least, confidentiality, forced reporting, and due process concerns remain challenges that we need great advocates around. So if you have follow-up questions and you weren't able to ask them today, um, you can definitely email. I am willing to take a few questions at the end if there are any. Okay, we've got one. Uh, Laura, you know, you talked about the differences between Cleary and Title IX and there being some advantages to some of the provisions in Cleary. How would a survivor, um, I know those two overlap in ways, like ch choose or take it, utilize some of the beneficial provisions in Cleary. Is there a specific way they would do that or, you know what I mean? Does yeah. I, it does, and I think that's where we definitely have to um, either think about, you know, direct advocacy or creation of resources. I don't think a lot of schools are going to go ahead and do an overlap of Title IX and Clear Act rights to the hands of survivors, but that is information. Um, I know the Department of Education has created that. The Cleary Center for Security on Campus has created that. Serve Justice, we have one we use in internally. We could always make an external version. But those are things that survivors can know about. Ideally, though, you know, survivors are obviously in a moment of crisis. They're worried about immediate needs such as ongoing education, health, justice. And so sometimes having advocates who are thinking from a legal perspective, where are the rights, what we can, can be helped here, I think that's where advocacy really comes in, knowing the overlap in advance and taking advantage of which one balances it out. I think a lot of schools know about Title IX and aren't as up on the Clery Act. And those regulations just went into effect July 1st. They're now um, responsible to the Department of Education for it. So I think that's, that's where a lot of the advantages will start to come. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, under one of the advocacy recommendations for investigation, you said, talked about having the right to bring an advisor present during meetings. When you say advisor, are you thinking of like academic advisor or like any other person that's like influential in that student life? If there's, you know, like, is it just a victim advocate or would you also recommend extending that to like, you know, if they were part of a student group that had an academic advisor? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so the term advisor, just to recap, comes from the Clery Act. Uh, both victims and accused both have the right to an advisor of choice. So this right attaches to any meetings associated with the institutional disciplinary process. And I will tell you as an advocate, I stretch that as far as I can. Um, technically, if you're just talking about accommodations or just talking about safety measures, the regulations separate that from the institutional disciplinary proceeding. But if you're making the meeting, add some conversation about the proceeding and you get the right to an advisor in it. Um, I think the choice of who to bring in really is up to a survivor, some thoughts to play with. Do they want someone who can protect against subpoenas later on? We have a lot of student groups that were talking about becoming advisors of choice. And the disadvantage is if an accused comes along, sues the school, sues the survivor, and wants to subpoena the advisor of choice, unless they're a lawyer or a counselor or someone else that has some privilege, and a lot of states have advocacy privileges, um, they are going to be subject to that subpoena. So I think being thoughtful about who goes in there, it is a survivor's choice. And it may be based on need. Um, are they really looking for someone who's just helping with academics? They're not worried about legal implications down the road. In that case, sure, it could be an on-campus advisor. It could be an off-campus advocate. It could be a parent, a friend. It really cannot be limited by school. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any other questions?
Okay. Well, as you all can see, there is an email account, a website, and even a Twitter. If you want to tweet us, at us, we are very happy at Serve Justice to answer any of your requests, your type of questions. We love offering any type of training to institutions if any follow-up is needed, and we also support change makers. If you're at your school and you want to advocate for some policy changes, we can give you the background support. If you're an advocate on the outside and you want to make some changes or address a specific issue, we are always here for you. But thank you so much all for joining. It has been my pleasure, and I look forward to supporting you all in your amazing advocacy into the future. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Laura. Um, I think we're really privileged to have you come and uh, provide this information, to share your story, and to really provide this uh, in-depth and fantastic overview of the federal uh, Title IX and the Clery Act. So I just want to extend a big thank you to you for taking your time uh, to present this really um, fantastic information. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all again for hosting. Have a great day.